So warm welcome everyone um, from around the world to join this uh, exciting, what we hope is the next um, 59 minutes at the Creative Bureaucracy Festival 2020. I'm Lisa Witter, one of the co-founders of A Political, and um, we're here today to talk about bridging politics and policy. Um, as an American, um, or if any of you watched the presidential debates um, the last day, this, this notion of where policy ends up in politics and if that was even politics is a question that we can debate. Um, I'm joined here by um, three really uh, remarkable um, people who are gonna join with me and with you to really get to the heart um, of this matter. So first we have my fantastic co-founder, Robin Scott. Can you wave, Robin? There we go. Fantastic. Then um, another one of Robin and my co-founders of the Apolitical Academy, Lindy Vimezambuco. We'll talk a little bit more about Lindy coming up. Um, Lindy is South African, so we're trying to get a bit of a global perspective here. Um, Robin um, grew up in Botswana, is a Brit, but also is a Kiwi, so she can cover most of the world, basically. And then we wanted our um, some representative to give us a perspective from Latin America, so that's Marco from Vitor Brazil. So we have a real sort of global perspective here, um, as well as folks who have spent their life either um, working with public servants or working in politics or doing their best to actually bridge that divide. So before we actually get into a big part of the, the conversation, I'd really like everyone who's joined, warm greetings. Um, if you've joined on direct on the Zoom link, could you go ahead and put into the Zoom link now, um, into the chat box, excuse me, your name, um, what you do and where you're from. We wanna get a sense of who are the other experts um, in the room here so we can we can call on them, wanna get a sense of the, the geography um, as we go. And while you're doing that, I wanna introduce my colleague, Johnny. Johnny, can you, can you wave at us? Um, Johnny is one of the, one of the uh, interns that we have at Apolitical. She's much more than that. She's a student at the Hertie School, and I am based here in Berlin, as is part of Apolitical. And the Hertie School um, is a fantastic feeder for great students in politics and public policy. So, Johnny, why don't you kick us off with um, a, our series of polling questions to get a sense of where the temperature is in this topic. Over to you. Okay. Poll question number one will come up quickly. Welcome everyone who's just joining. Always love in Zoom when you're waiting for a poll. It's a moment to take a deep breath of Zen, right? Um, Matthias, thank you. You're an MPA student at the Heritage School and work as an EU um, political advisor. Great to meet you. Julianne Fuchs, junior consultant at Demos, um, city of Freiburg. So we've got some Germans in the house, that's great. Simon from Vienna, Austria, a professor of sociology at the Technical University. Um, fantastic, nice to meet you. Anybody else wanna introduce themselves in the chat? Johnny, how are those polls coming along? Are they up? Can everyone see the polls? Okay, poll number one. Um, what topic more represents you and your work? Politics, policy, neither, or you can't separate the two? Try not to think about it too much. Just answer, hello, Kaldina Brown from Canada, Bjorn from Denmark, warm welcome. Johnny, when we have lots of people responding, let's take a look at what we've got. Hello, Tamara from California, fantastic. Take a look at her background in the chat room. Someone from Poland, what an international crew. Okay, Johnny, let's see the results. or tried to see the results. Can you see it? Or can the others see it? Yep, okay. Okay, it's just me then. Okay, Johnny, can you read out the results for, for me? Okay, so um, eight people, which is 50%, say policy interests them more. And 19% um, say politics. The other 19% say you can't separate the two. And 13% say neither. Okay. Um, good. We got a, we got a real mix in the crowd, but a little bit more of the policy geeks than the political animals. I'm figuring it is called the Creative Bureaucracy Festival. Okay, next poll question, mm -hmm. and I will also put this in the chat if for some reason you can't see this. 
Here we go. Second, should politics and policy be A, work in tandem, B, be totally separate, or C, depends on the policy topic? I'm asking you very, giving you very sort of stark, we know things are more complicated, but which one do you feel first? Again, if you just joined us, we've got 25 participants plus the live stream. Hello on the live stream. Um, please do introduce yourself in the chat. It's good to get perspective. Friedrich's got really cool uh, background there, Friedrich. I love it. Very cool. <laughs> okay, Johnny, what do we say? Should we bridge politics and policy or should they be separate or does it depend? Okay, go ahead and read it out when you can see it. Yeah, uh, so over here, 50, it's super close. 53% say it depends on the policy topic and the remaining 47% say they should work in tandem. Nobody thinks they should be separate, which is- Okay, okay, great. Let's go to um, our third question. Um, and it is, has political polarization brought politics and policy A, closer together, farther apart or the same? Um, hello from Sweden, Frederick. Um, hello, Sharon from the um, Design and Royal College of Art. Uh, Sharon Lewis, South African working in Bangladesh, fantastic. So has political polarization brought politics um, and policy closer together for their operatives just still the same? And we just have one more after this which is one very timely to um, at least the American political system right now. Bjorn's taking us for a walk through his house. He's committed, he's sticking with it. Impressive Bjorn. Okay, okay, Johnny, what do we got? Okay, um, I'm sharing the results right now. So yeah, 74% say political polarization brings politics and policy farther apart and 26% say closer together. Okay, so nothing the same. It's really interesting. We're gonna talk about that more. And then the last one is a bit of my favorite one. In general, not just focused on the particular American election, which I'm obsessed with, but in general, do political campaigns cause confusion or bring clarity to public discourse? Here we go, I'm putting in the chat as well. Last one. Hello, Letizia. Welcome. Why don't you introduce yourself in the chat box if you've just joined us. Let's get a sense of the, the global spread here. Okay. okay, Johnny, what do we have? We have the results. 65% uh, say confusion and 35% say clarity. Okay, confusion, very little clarity. Okay, um, so let's go ahead and get started. I wanna um, kick it off with our with our real experts, which all of you are as well, but the folks who have prepared and who bring so much um, experience. Um, Lindivi Mezumbuko was the first um, black woman to be the opposition leader um, for the DA in South Africa. She is a political powerhouse um, on the continent and the world. Um, most importantly, she's my friend and Robin's friend and recently um, has co-founded and is running um, nonpartisan political training institutes in Southern Africa and um, building out a global network. Lindy, um, tell us something just quick about your background that brought you to politics that may not be in your bio. Um, yeah, so I'm a musician. Um, I, I sing and I play the drums, the steel drums, the piano uh, and the guitar. And <laughs> so um, I don't know how well known this is outside the Southern African continent, but music is a very big part of political discourse. You sing at the beginning of every rally, you harmonize, it's almost a, sort of a quasi religious experience. And in fact, many political struggle songs come from church songs. That's how um, liberation movement stalwarts would keep secret um, their slogans and their sort of, um, there's, a, there's even a great one from the, from the current ruling party in South Africa that teaches people about socialism. It's, 
they converted a church song into a lesson about the politics of the left. So um, for me, that was always a very sort of a deft combination of things because so much of your time um, on stage, singing, learning your breathing, projecting, articulating, um, is both the practice and the principle of politics, which is clarity, um, you know, voice, uh, scale, sound, um, and all of those things. So it wasn't intended to bring me into politics. It's what I did before I was a politician, but it's a, it's a set of skills that has stood me in very good stead in my political career. Oh, Lindy, maybe at the end, could we get a little song to... Ah, I'm also very shy. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe, maybe, we can warm, <laughs> maybe we can warm you up to it. Um, Marco, Marco um, works for Vitor Brazil and is part of the, the movement in Brazil to really support public servants. What you give us a little bit more about what you do at Vitor Brazil and something in your background that uh, brought you to this public service policy space. Thank you, Lisa. Very happy to be here. So Vitor Brazil is a nonprofit organization that attracts, selects, and develops people to work in the, pub, in the Brazilian public sector. And our mission is to create a diverse uh, and talent network of individuals to, to enhance our public sector. And we have over 500 people in our network today that have worked in all state governments across, across Brazil and also in major cities. Um, and uh, more recently, we've just released this year our public administrator residency program, which is similar to a medical residency, but focused to create a new generation of uh, public problem solvers and implementers. Uh, about myself, a, a little thing that's in my bio that brought me to work with the, with the government, I joke that I work with the public sector to be contrary to my father. Uh, <laughs> and, I think, and I think it's part, partly true. When I was a kid, uh, I remember that my father said to me, never work with the government and never trust the government because his firm bankrupted because the government defaulted on him. And those were really, really tough times for our family and for us. And I understand how upsetting this was for him. But over time, especially being exposed to the huge inequalities in Brazil uh, from the side of my mother's family in the Northeast of Brazil and also in the work I did, I had to disagree with him. And I just hope that we can expect more from us as a community and, and as a people that we should be able to coordinate ourselves to solve our public problems and issues and that the government has a fundamental role in being the protagonist in this change. So that's, that's something that I wanted to bring. <laughs> Marco, is your dad proud of you now? I think so, yes. <laughs> At first he was like, why, why are you doing this? But now I think he gets and I think he agrees with me as well. <laughs> So fantastic, Robin Scott, who um, is my co-founder and one of my dearest friends. We've been on this apolitical journey now for six years intensely. Um, I know a lot about you, so I'm wondering if there's going to be something in your background um, that we don't know. Just a little bit about Robin. She's um, a brilliant science, math mind, a technologist, um, has worked in prisons, a writer. She, she's a Renaissance woman that does many things. So Robin, what's in your, what's in your background that's really driven, the, driven this home for you? Well, first, very important fact. Um, so I have, I have witnessed Lindy singing a lullaby to my, my little boy, who's also Lisa's godson. And I, can, I, I, I really encourage us to try and get her to sing at the end. It's wonderful. <laughs> um, so I, I spent a lot of time working in prisons and one of the things prisons teach you is that most people, they teach you lots of things. First of all, that most people end up there because of not any intrinsic badness, but because of failures in policy upstream. So people let down by education policy, by health policy and so forth. And this is particularly the case in a country like South Africa where, where I've worked, where um, the government is still failing to deliver on a lot of basic support. And then you spend a while in prisons and you realize that you can do great innovation, but you're not gonna really achieve anything unless you move to that upstream point and exert leverage. And nothing has more leverage than, than government to fix those problems. 
Uh, I've also, I grew up with incredibly iconoclastic parents who dragged me around the world and once even moved our house from one town to another. Um, so we always lived in extreme unorthodoxy. And I've been interested for a long time in what I think of as like life le leverage. How in this fleeting moment on earth can you use your life to greatest effect? And I think government and politics for all its unpopularity for the re you know, one of the reasons Marco described is just the best place in the world for leverage. Oh, great. Thanks, Robin. I, I, I wanted to start us off talking about the why, because I think it's super interesting and, and, and really easy, actually, even more easy that when we talk about politics and policy, either bureaucrats are sort of faceless, nameless people or politics, they're the, they're the other. And the truth is people in politics and policy are people. They're people like us, and most of us choose really hard paths to make a difference, right? This is not an easy thing, whether it's working in prisons or being in the opposition or working in the public administration in Brazil. Um, these are hard things to do and um, really commend all of you for choosing the hard thing to do to, to make change at scale. So let's get to, to our, our question here. And if people feel like it, please do chat, put in the chat box why you got into politics or policy. It'd be really interesting to get sort of a, the flavor um, of your why, because that's that's why we're here. Um, so I'm going to start off. I've, I've um, prepared um, a couple uh, things in advance for the speakers to speak to. And Robin, I'm gonna just start with you. Um, at Apolitical, we talk a lot about the democracy flywheel. It seems like the perfect way to set up where politics and policy come to place. Can you go ahead and share that? Talk about that. Uh, totally, but f first a little bit of background. So I'm, I'm sure you're all, um, uh, wedded to Amazon, um, like it or not, most of us are these days. And the idea of a flywheel really comes out of the study of um, Jim Collins, the management author, about what makes um, all sorts of organizations, but what has particularly driven these tech organizations to such enormous success. And the idea is that flywheels are a self-reinforcing loop where each component um, interacts with the other and improves it as long as that component is improving. So in Amazon's case, it's that they have low prices, which bring more customers, which brings more third party sellers, which allows them to get more out of their fulfillment centers and their website out of their fixed costs, which means they can lower prices further. And that builds this incredible virtuous loop, at least virtuous for the company, um, that crushes competitors and builds giants. So we started looking at what does the equivalent look like in democracy? If you look at the system of democracy, because we often quite atomistic in the way we talk about democracy. We've, there's this problem, we've got to fix it and then everything will be fixed. But in fact, it is a flywheel too. So you've got, um, first of all, you've got the citizens or people, not necessarily citizens who need to value the political process, need to be informed about it and need to bother to participate in elections. Then you've got politicians. So that drives politicians who provide representation and um, provide a policy vision and guide the allocation of resources in the third, um, the third component, which is the civil service who advise politicians and then deliver and implement policies. And each of those components in this beautiful flywheel reinforce the other. You get more trust in government civil services deliver so citizens think it's worth to, worth voting and so on. And what's happened recently is that we have began, we've begun to neglect all the components of the flywheel. So democracy writ large has slowed down. And that's why at Apolitical, we're passionate about working across that wheel and supporting other organizations who are working across it as well. So yeah, it's, it's a kind of a, an ode to um, that bridging piece with the citizens really um, being being the power in that. So we 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 want to step back, sort of big picture, sort of the why, and then big picture how these things can work together. Um, now I want to get into the fun of the politics, Lindy, um, and turn to you. Um, South Africa is not a, um, a an easy and gentle place to do politics. We've all seen um, the stories of the apartheid movement and Nelson Mandela and um, the work that's going on still there to deal with the injustices. Um, I want to hear from your perspective, um, when, we're, when you were in politics directly, how did or didn't politics and policy come together? Oh, you're muted. I've decided that there's a dollar in a jar for <laughs> 
for children every time it's muted we should start I had to be the first one to do that <laughs> <Go>. <laughs> um so um you know politics and policy for me when I entered politics were almost completely divorced from one, one another. It was one of the things I found very frustrating about being a backbench MP. It sometimes felt as though those of us in parliament who were uh, legislating were at the receiving end of a deep well of expertise in the civil service and never the twain did meet. There was a, a contempt from the civil service for you know sweet talking politicians and a kind of slight bit of jealousy amongst the politicians for the really kind of superior and very intelligent um, and highly vetted members of the civil service. And one of the things I tried to do when I was opposition leader is change my caucus in particular, the hundred or so MPs that I led, um, uh, change their perception of policy, not as something that happens um, only in, in government, but as something that has to be the core of the, the expression of the party's values, the, you know, the, the core of every march, every campaign, every television appearance, all of the poetry that we do as political leaders has to be grounded in a strong policy framework. Um, and so it became, you know, everything from what the chief whip measured their performance on, um, you know, to the, you know, the, the nugget of, of, of information behind every press statement, every op-ed, we really valued sort of the intellectual and policy development um, side of our role as leaders, instead of just you know, the way it was when I first entered politics, where it just felt a little bit like we were a PR machine and we would slogan near at rallies and kind of shout things, but the people in government did the real work. Um, and I think that's always a very difficult thing to do in an environment in which people really perceive the public service, um, the civil service and politicians as two parts of a whole that need to be kept separate. You know, the one independent, information rich, the other highly political and full of rhetoric. Um, but actually, it doesn't need to be that way. Some of the biggest policy successes, the best legislation we ever wrote, um, you know, the budgets we got increased in the police service and the justice system came on the back of us designing a policy, simplifying it for people to understand better, and then going out into the streets, knocking from door to door, printing leaflets, buying billboard space in order to advocate for a youth wage subsidy or a specialist court system for gender-based violence, or for better allocation of funding to schools. Once people understood the policy behind the ideology, um, they were able to get behind issues rather than just personalities. And I think that's a really great way to empower voters. So they're not just picking you as a stand-in to think for them in office, but you know, throughout your term, you're demonstrating that you are an intellectual powerhouse and that you take their needs as members of the public very seriously. I just want to I want to just quote you on two things, Lindy, you talked about the, uh, poetry as policy leaders, um, which is not disconnected from the lullabies and the singing, right? That's mm -hmm. very, very poetic. And then also mm, just listening to you, you basically described politics as the sales process for policy, which it's a really interesting thing because there's two ways, so there's multiple ways, but two ways to think of um, politics. One is you elect a person in a representative democracy to go and make those decisions for you. Mm. And one is you um, express policy desires in, in, a, in a big picture that you, then you go elect people to sort of technocratically figure out how to mm -hmm. then go back and sell them to you. So it, it's interesting. There are two parts and different expectations. Um, I live in Germany. We have very technocratic politics, much more than places like America, which are very... Um, personality-based um, politics. Marco, um, you run this program at Vitor Brazil with public servants. What do you teach them about how to engage with politics? And what are some not so obvious insights you've had in the stories that they've told you about what's working or not about the political system? You're in a hot political time at the federal level right now. There's often um, clashes between the public servant and, and the executive. So curious what you're, what you're hearing in Brazil. Completely. Thank you, Lisa. Um, well, this question make, makes me think a lot about our work at Vitor and the systemic change we're trying to build. I come from a school that believes that the realm of possible solutions for our public problems have to be technically correct, politically supportable, and implementable. And they seem very independent when we state them, and actually they're very interdependent. Um, and I agree that it's very important to have people that specialize in each of those poles like people that are very technical or people that work only in politics. 
but I also believe that, that we need people to manage the bri and to bridge those three poles. Um, and this is the diverse and engaged network we're trying to build at Vitor. But I think there are three key elements that we do to reach this uh, regarding the, what we teach them and what we seek, we seek for them. And the first one is focusing on the development of not only technical skills, but also leadership skills, so, um, such as communication, how you dialogue with someone you disagree, how to have an empathetic posture, or how do you do context diagnostics, all of the very much necessary uh, skills for this adaptive challenge. And actually, the experience itself of leaving this challenge in the public sector is where a lot of the learning comes from. I mean, the stories that we hear from, from our fellows of how all of a sudden uh, the political leader changes or a project that they're dealing with, um, it's not implemented or there are barriers that they're not, they do not foresee and that they blame themselves. All of the leadership failures that they have while they're trying to implement this, the, the, those policies in, in real life. Um, the second thing I, I think it's very important is, is strengthening core values. And we at Vitor believe that uh, we, we, we believe in a super partisanship uh, work. So it's very nice to have people that are from different political spectrums working together. Uh, and the, the nicest stories that we hear are from people that are from uh, a left wing side, but are working in a right wing government and then they're understanding, um, uh, having a pragmatic view or on, on the topics that they're working and knowing that they can do a change on that. So that's, that's something that we, we value a lot. And for another example, it's ethics as well. Uh, as you try to move away from only a technical position and bridge to the political position or to the implementation position, uh, our fellows have to, lead to, to deal with a lot of um, ethical dilemmas and having tools to deal with that, to think about that. How do you implement? Who's gonna have the benefit first? All of those things are very important when you're working in the field and trying to bridge that. And finally, and I think that's the most important, important element that we bring, which is strengthening our network. Just to know you're not alone, trying to make this change, just changing the government is very, very powerful. And the members of our, our, our network themselves articulate discussions on how to bridge this politics and policy. For example, they, they, found, they founded a, a group that's called Vitor Politics, uh, where they discuss how do they deal with that or to, they understand or they do diagnostic in our network to see what are the political view of our network or what are the challenges that they're facing, even uh, discussing with people that are working in campaigns. A lot of our fellows go work in campaigns or some of them are pre-candidates in this upcoming election in Brazil. So all of this work among the network, that's, that's the, the, the space where we think it's most valuable for people that are trying to make this change um, in the field uh, inside from within the government. My friend, really interesting. Um, we'd love to hear, learn more about that. Um, I'm curious, uh, we're so curious about how many people in public service actually at some point in their career say, no, I should go run. Um, I really want to go run. If, if, if you're one of those public servants on the line now and you want to share how you're thinking about at some point getting involved in the politics side of it, we'd love to love to hear from that. Um, Lindy does a lot of work thinking about um, the politics side of it in the in the public leadership work you do at the Apolitical Academy. Um, I'd love to hear from you and, and Robin, I'm up with you next. Um, what do you wish that public servants knew about politics that you feel like they don't? And it would be really helpful. Um, I, I wish, and I spend a lot of time implementing this wish at Apolitical Academy, I, I wish public servants would take more seriously um, the narrative building, storytelling, the poetry side of get, getting um, their, their policies implemented. I think it would, it, you know, if public servants saw themselves in much more than an instrumental fashion, but also saw themselves as people who have to bring constituencies together, convince stakeholders, you know, uh, bring people to, 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 to an understanding of new ideas, um, I think there'd be a lot less of that tension between, you know, the campaigning poetry and the, and the governing in, in, in prose. Um, I think one, one of the clearest, I think, um, examples of how um, the civil service got trapped in, in technocracy and politicians got trapped in perceptions is the COVID-19 pandemic, right? So, you know, there was a lot of expert advice coming from economists, coming from the health sector, 
um, from medical specialists, epidemiologists, and so forth, being fed into political leadership at the side of government. And then government was having to make really complex decisions uh, using very little information and communicate that information and communicate that vision in a way that would bring people with them, that would say, I'm not sure about all of the facts, I don't have all the information, but you can trust me to lead on this issue. And it would have been so great if the specialists like Dr. Fauci were actually out in the field doing the same work because it's almost going straight to the source. You don't have to translate the specialist knowledge from the, the bureaucrat to the politician. You can actually have bureaucrats on television giving interviews, helping people understand and engaging in that work of bringing people with them in a crisis where there's really no time to be translating right from technocracy to, to, to political discourse. And I think it's a really good example of how both sides need to borrow skills from one another. Um, politicians need to have more meat on the bones of their campaign slogans. And, um, and bureaucrats in the civil service, technocrats, need to have a little bit more flair and a little bit more engagement and a little bit more design thinking around how they interact with people, how they make policy and science and economics understandable for ordinary voters so that they can feel like they're being held by a leadership that they can trust. Well, thanks for that, Lindy. I'm, I'm struck, um, Charles and Robin, or those of you who have been to other creative bureaucracy festivals, that um, the, the big trend in government now is human-centered design. Like, who would have thought, you know, human-centered design is the hot new thing? I thought that's what we were doing all along. But it is basically part of what you're saying, Lindy, is that public servants are less technocratic, cascading down a policy and thinking much more about who are the people, how do we co-create um, and what do we do? And, and Robin Scott with that, you know, at Apolitical, we sit on, on this platform of information, data and knowledge about what public servants want. Why don't you tell people a little bit more about what Apolitical is and what they're telling us they want to learn? Well, just to, to sound a note of um, optimism um, following on from what Lindy said. So, so we now have nearly 100,000 policymakers and public servants from 170 countries using our platform to share um, and find uh, policy solutions, approaches to, to common problems, and to take uh, courses to build skills and depth in different policy areas. And interestingly, um, the majority of our platform uh, comprises bureaucrats. We do have some, um, we have political people, but it's mainly bureaucrats. And storytelling is one of the top most sought after skills every time we do anything on it. So the good news is that there's, there's broad recognition amongst a really diverse group of, of public servants. Um, maybe just to, to point out a couple of the other things that there's a lot of demand for. Um, the stuff we've mentioned, um, human-centered design, citizen engagement and the like. Change management and leading change always massive because I think, and, and going back to the the kind of politics policy um, issue, often public servants are given this really difficult challenge where they have to become internal politicians within the civil service. They have to marshal lots of disparate groups who all have slightly competing interests because of the bad design of most governments. And then they have to, as a project is inevitably implemented and is short of some resources and start, starts failing and becomes toxic, they then have to like get everyone behind them to put more resources um, in it. So there's lots of interest in how to do that compellingly, um, which can sometimes be, for example, and this is sort of an adjacent skill, lots of interest around data. So how can you take what is normally in the technocratic realm and put it into the realm of, of sort of practice and big picture outcomes for, for citizens and difficult trade-offs? So we specialize in all of that and um, at our heart is the belief that, that most of the knowledge that we need is actually already there. Um, it's just not evenly distributed. And we are trying to unlock the knowledge within government and um, make it flow rapidly across different cities and, and different countries. Thanks, Robin. I, I want to get the audience in. So if you have, um, not an audience, the, the, the team of people around the Zoom call looking at each other, if you have questions, please um, put them in the chat box and I will try to, to call on people. Or if you have a big takeaway so far, like what something that struck you as interesting or different. Marco, I'm particularly thinking about you and the, the situation in Brazil around 
some of the ethical questions um, around where politics and policy come together. I've spoken to another, a number of public servants, not just in Brazil, but happens to be where if the executive comes in and puts forward a policy that they in their heart don't feel like that's the right way forward, it's a real ethical dilemma um, about what to do about that. So what, how are your public servants talking about that? You know, how, how are they um, working with that? And we, we hear a lot around the need to bring public servants closer to like asking their opinions more if they're gonna be doing the implementation. So I'm just curious, what do you do when you disagree with your politician? That's that's a very interesting question and a, and a very tough one to be dealing with when you when you're in the field and you and you find this ethical dilemma. I think the first uh, I think the first thing that we advise our fellows and we try to teach them is to identify that that you're living an ethical dilemma. And sometimes you, do, you you're just like so constrained or feeling unease, but you don't understand what is the ethical dilemma that's posed upon you or that you're living. And that's. And that's a part of uh, having a, more, a, a better understanding of ethics in general, of different views or worldviews in ethics, or also of, and also of self-knowledge, of understanding your own values. And then by, when, you, when you identify that you're living this ethical dilemma, you have to be strategic on how you deal with it. Um, and, the, and so what are the options that you have on the table? Uh, how, how far off are you? How, how stressful is that for you? Is this something that's going to make you do a, an ethical suicide? which is leave the organization because you can't deal with this ethical dilemma that you're dealing with, or are, are there ways that you can try to influence or to, po or to show the um, conflicts that are being posed because of the decisions that are being made? Um, and uh, it's, not, it's, it's not an easy, it, it's never easy to face an ethical dilemma, especially when you do not have the authority. And when you do not have the authority, you have to either try to find a way to use leadership to change it, or you just have to uh, uh, either accept it or leave. So th th those moments are very hard. So what, what do we do is that we have our compliance channels where uh, our fellows can reach us and seek for help. And most of the times what we do to help them is to structure the problem for them and then to help them uh, seek alternatives and think, on, and think how can they deal with the situation. And if it's something that's really unethical or has to do with corruption or something, a deviation of the work in the public sector, we also try to instruct them on uh, the channels that they may use inside their, their public sector to, uh, to make uh, uh, anonymous uh, complaints or uh, the, even decide what's, how they could face the, this issue. But uh, facing an ethical dilemma is, very, is always hard and there's no easy answer. It's very specific to each case that you're living. Thanks. And I think it's just really worth stating as we become more polarized and the center moves out, that there will be centrists or people in government that have to or are asked to do things they disagree with, which is not an easy thing. This next question I want to ask, um, I'm going to put to you, Lindy, um, and then maybe I'll ask some others. I, I One of the um, inspirations or things that scared me that that brought me and Robin together to, to co-found a political was a friend of mine is a um, is a minister of um, a, a topic. Um, and uh, when he got elected, there was a crisis and he called me to ask for policy advice. And I was really nervous about like, why are you calling to ask me for policy advice? Isn't there, isn't that what you know, right? Like you are the minister of X. Have you spent any time doing this? Are you surrounded by this? And I thought, wow, what, what a big difference we could make if if he could find policy advice the way we could find a lump in a mattress on TripAdvisor. So that was a big sort of driver for Robin and I to think about how to bring those things together. But I wanna ask in this question, like, is it too much to think that politicians should be policy experts? I mean, Hillary Clinton, for those of you who followed American politics was a total geek about healthcare policy, right? And she was not loved by many for that geekiness. Should politicians be policy experts? What's the, what are the pros and cons? Or should they just do the poetry and the selling? I think certainly at the level of government, um, politicians need to accept that they are going to end up being reshuffled from portfolio to portfolio because their job is actually to be representatives of the people. So to the extent that they have access to expertise, they should be seeking it from other people and then leading. What, what they are principally is leaders who understand the framework within which they're working and who understand the needs of the people that they govern, who can read reports and understand statistics, but whose job really is to find 
the most effective solution to pressing problems in a society. So I think uh, politicians have to be great readers, right? They have to be able to interpret data, interpret information and understand it very quickly in order to be able to make sound decisions. But the key is not to be a master of any particular one thing. I, I do I do abhor this notion that, you know, the CEO of the biggest listed company in the country should be treasury minister or, you know, a, a university professor who headed up education at an Ivy should go and run the education system. The education system is much bigger than the academics of the thing. It's also about logistics. It's also you know, about, uh, you know, getting textbooks delivered to school on time, getting curricular design. Every portfolio has got a multiplicity of areas of expertise that one person cannot possibly embody. So I, I come, I fall down on the school of jack of all trades, master of none for your ministers and for your politicians um, and, and specialist specialization for those who are in the civil service. But at that layer of political leadership, ministerial officers, prime ministerial officers, and so forth, there needs to be a comp complementary level of expertise. Your special advisors, right, shouldn't be as they are, I think, in the UK, and I'm going to be a little controversial, but they shouldn't all be from the same two universities, having done the same two degrees, right? There should be a mix of people who have expertise in the particular portfolio that you're operating in. When you move to another, you bring in experts who can support you in that area as well, so that you're getting specialist advice as a minister, which might contradict the advice you're getting from the civil service, which may have its own priorities, which may have its own, you know, you know, incentives and disincentives. And that's a healthy tension that needs to exist between the two. Um, so no, politicians need to have a great grasp of policy making. They need to understand how it's done, but they don't need to do it as part of their core business. Their job is to make decisions based on complex information coming at them from various directions. I, I wanna do a quick follow-up and Marco, if you wanna get in here and then Robin's I'm going to ask you to respond to uh, Matthias's question around change management. Um, I'm struck, Lindy, and I happen to agree with you that the, the, the job of the politician is that sort of representation level um, and to be doing the selling and the poetry. And, and really also there's a lot of... Um, Schaffendus in Germany, there's a lot of just moral communication um, around sort of what, who are we as a society and, and what do we do or should we do? Um, but I, I, I'm wondering, oftentimes to make a policy work, it, it's in the implementation. You got to sell it, but then it falls apart in implementation. So I see, Mark, are you shaking your head? What do politicians need to know about implementation that they don't? And Marco, what are your public servants saying about that? You know, change the world in three months. I've got a mandate. So Lindy first, then Marco, then Robin, we're going to go to change management. So Lindy. Oh, you're still muted. Another another dollar for children. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, that's such an important point. Um, so, you know, the, the, the one thing you can't have is cabinet ministers, heads of government, mayors, who either when faced with crisis or when, are, when they're trying to implement their manifesto problems, constantly have to report back to the voters, well, it's more complicated than it looked during the campaign, right? They need to have a certain amount of knowledge about what the limitations are going to be on their big picture vision, if any, and be a little bit realistic about how they communicate that. But I really do believe that there is a very specific set of skills associated with being a political leader, which includes the knowledge of an experience of how long it takes to get things done. Whether that experience is from the real world before you were a politician or from legislating while you were in parliament or from working in a different sphere of government and so on and so forth. But the, the scale of the thing is what's really challenging in government. So, you know, Yes, it's tempting for politicians to announce big picture plans and make massive promises, but they should know too that elections are coming up in two and a half years or five years. And unless they can meet those promises, they, they face the, real, the realistic prospect of, of, of losing power. But in addition to that, I also, I believe in this model that existed you know, in, the U, in the UK, in China, where mandarins in government had the skill of implementing other people's manifestos, right? It's part of the skill set of the civil service. You get a manifesto or it's election time, even during election time, you have two manifestos, 
you know, between the two major parties and you start to work through what the implementation of both would look like within the framework of the law of the constitution of, you know, the public finance management act, et cetera, et cetera. And you're able to give advice about that rather than pushing back and trying to maintain a status quo. So I think there's some work, there's some work that's incumbent on the ministerial team and the team of specialists. And there's a lot more work that's incumbent on the civil service. And I think part of that is an acceptance on both sides that they can't do everything and an acceptance on, on the ministerial side that they, are, they, are, they have a responsibility to have expertise in-house and on the civil service side that they have a responsibility to implement the manifesto promises of the democratically elected government, right? Um, and those I think are concessions that both sides don't often want to make because they're very difficult concessions to make. They increase the workload, they increase the emotional intensity and the, the levels of engagement, they challenge trust um, and so on and so forth. But, but ultimately implementation is the key. And unless the government can follow through on its promises, demonstrably so with the data to back it up, they're gonna find themselves in trouble um, come election time. And I guess that's the crude mathematics of democracy is the hope that, you know, if people don't serve you in office, you can fire them five years later. Yeah, I'm just always struck by how people, it's time for a change. And there, we didn't even have time to implement the last people's thing, right? Because change takes time. It's a real burden to then have policies that are implementable um, in, in faster cycles, which is a whole nother um, session, I'm sure. Marco, anything any anything else to add to that? If not, I wanna go to a speed round of a bunch of questions. Any big insights from the public service side on implementation? Yes, so I just, uh, I completely agree with Lindy in many, many of the things that she said. And uh, one thing that we, we joke at Vitor is that when political leaders do not want to do something, the chances of having that being implemented is usually zero. So uh, sometimes also the public servants trying to go against politics or going the different direction that does not that does not work neither. Um, and one thing that uh, I agree with Lindy that politicians do not necessarily need to have uh, or they do need to have a sort of comp competencies that are necessary to be politicians in the political spectrum. And maybe they can be strategic on how they acquire or how they set their teams with the competencies that they need to implement. So the, the only thing that I would add to, to Lindy's is that uh, one thing that I would advise politicians is to be very strategic on how they think about people, talent man management, their teams and human resources to make their policies be implemented and their promises in campaign be implemented. Super, okay, Robin, it looks like you and um, Matisse um, handled uh, the, the question he had around change management. So I'm going to do a quick speed round of questions. So I'm going to really make you all be disciplined. And in the chat room, you can also put your answer to. So my first and speed round is, how has extreme, as for you, Robin, how has extreme polarization and social media changed the relationship between politics and policy? In a word, Robin. Another dollar for children, Robin. I put it in the chat. Uh, you heard me on the chat. Degraded it. Degraded it. Marco. I think I, uh, I would say it's in, 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 it made it hotter. It harder. Me... Harder. Lindy, are you saying harder too? What's your word? Sexier. Sexier. Oh, okay. Yeah. Degraded and sexier. So that, that those can be the same thing sometimes. Okay. Next thing um, I'm going to ask is how might tech impact the bringing together or not of politics? So all this new tech, all this new citizen engagement, civ tech, all of this, is, is technology going to help bridge politics and policy? And will that be good or bad? Robin, in a sentence or two. I think it's entirely non-deterministic. It's how we use it. And we are at the brink of it going uh, both uh, to heaven or hell. Heaven or hell. Uh, Marco. You guys can stay think, off think, mute because I'm going to go quick. Marco. I think we're, we're in the process of learning, we're making mistakes and learning. Making mistakes and learning with heaven and hell. Lindy. Yeah, I agree with both Robin and Marco. It can foment ethnic tensions in Southeast Asia. It can improve oversight, you know, in West Africa. It depends on the people using it. Non-deterministic, will it be heaven or hell? If you have not seen um, the social dilemma, dilemma. 
um, watch it. Um, at Apolitical this summer, we worked with um, 45 uh, bureaucrats and policymakers to ask the question, what do we do about governing the internet um, before it begins to govern us? Um, so the so next speed one, this is my favorite one. Lindy, um, you're the goddess of the world. You can wave a magic wand and make politics and policy work better together. What do you do? If I can wave a magic wand, um, I would demand better, newer, um, more radical <laughs> ideas. Oh, that's my dog. I, he, he agrees. <laughs> Better, newer, more radical ideas. Yeah, um, what Elizabeth Warren calls uh, big uh, structural changes as opposed to tinkering at the edges. That can only happen with expertise on the one hand and campaigns on the other. Big new ideas, big new ideas. How about you, Marco? You get a magic wand to change this either divide or not of politics and policy. What do you do? I'd like to solve the information as asymmetry and increase the level of trust. I think that's... Me too, me too. Robin. Yeah, mine, mine speaks to trust. It's one step back. It would be for the media and the information medium writ large to accurately represent what government delivers to people. So the good and the bad, because we never hear about the good and that creates this antagonistic relationship between politics and citizens and government, which means it's under-resourced in terms of talent and money and that creates a vicious cycle. Yeah, I'm really struck by thinking back of this guy named Barack Obama who ran for president of the United States and he talked about making politics cool again and a government that we believe in again um, and letting us be critical but not live in cynicism. And this is what I'm really worried about that the cynicism has taken over and we need to uh, have a vaccination for political and policy cynicism because it's not, it's not helping. Now I wanna to turn to you all. Um, anyone wanna come on? If you had a magic wand, what would you do? Julianne, you've been active in the chat. I'm gonna call on you. You get a magic wand. What do you do? Uh, yes, I would increase uh, cooperation in that sense that they work really closely together, having, I don't know, weekly, monthly meetings and, and actually talking directly face to face about those things. Understand each other, sit in each other's shoes. How about you, Lou? Do you have your, uh, your, your camera on? Do you want to add to this what you would do if you had a magic wand? He's thinking about it. Um, Frederick in Sweden with the cool... Uh, background well i would i would um add in some extra intellectual capacity in, uh, to our political board at the parliament yeah smarts um yeah <laughs> so much to say about that watching the watching the debate in america rafael how about you i completely agree with frederick uh, more human capacity of parliament more human. How about you, um, Adrian? And then we'll go to Sharon. How about you, Adrian? I just see you come off mute. Hello, hello everyone from Paris. Well, for me, it's more like an engagement between uh, public servants and politicians. Uh, make uh, make the politicians think more like public servants and make the public servants think more like a politician. Like both of them have a perspective on citizens. Yeah. Not yes. More, more thinking about citizens and less about power. Voila. Yeah. More about citizens and less about power. How to use that power for citizens. Sharon, how about you? Uh, for me, it's like I just want to engage like poor people or more than liberal people, engage in them um, to the pro policy making process. So like policy makers, they can know better about uh, how to patronize the problem that should be tackled first. So it's like, yeah, my word in my mind. <laughs> That's great. Jocelyn, how about you? Hi. Um, gosh, well, how long have you got? But um, I suppose one thing I, I see as key is the social media thing. And I believe it was Bill Clinton uh, or, well, his presidency that agreed the terms um, of operation with uh, Facebook and social media when they put in the clause about not having to be responsible for editorial or, you know, ed editorial responsibility. And um, I do think that was probably a big mistake. I'm not saying there's an easy answer to that either, but uh, that if I could go back in time and, and change that, that would be my magic wand. Fantastic, yeah. 
Johnny, how about you? I think mine would be super idealistic, but for political leaders to reconsider opening up borders because, well, then we wouldn't have any refugees. <laughs>